Over the course of last week, I spent most of my time looking at the speculation, design ideas, and the origins of the Omega Ultradeep. This meant that I didn't have much time to look at the development and the release of the new Seamaster Professional, the new color line, as well as the 57 Speedmaster. These are two watches that I think greatly deserve your attention for different reasons, and over the course of this video I want to address them both. So word on the street is, a lot of talk has been going around how Omega is now copying Rolex. And I mean, you look at these watches lined up side by side, and I think there is a good argument to be made that they are following suit with the choices of colors, even though Omega has been using so many colors on their watches in the past. I am a strong supporter of Omega as a brand. I definitely want to stand up for them, but yes, I do also believe that the colors are way too similar to be just sheer coincidence. My real gripe with the brand, like with what many of us say, is that the variations of these watches, there's just too many of them. I can understand that having a variance of these kinds of pieces is great because it's able to reach a larger audience. The downside is that it's difficult sometimes to separate the wheat from the chaff. And then basically the good stuff is there, but it can be hard to find, hard to distill. Case in point, we look to this new green Seamaster Professional that I'll be calling the Seaweed Seamaster from now on. They didn't bring out 50 variations, they only brought out one watch, one color, and it's the piece that seems to be getting the most amount of attention compared to all the other models that the brand released this year. That's not by accident. And I think in a way it shows a level of confidence when you can produce just one variant of the product. So naturally, again, we talk about how a brand is copying Rolex, and this seems to be another direct comparison where some are saying that Omega is now looking at the Hulk Submariner for inspiration. It is true that the Hulk Submariner, the Somit Submariner, definitely made the color green on a sports watch a lot more popular, but they weren't the first pieces to do it. We can largely credit the beginning of this craze when we look to the Seiko Alpinist, to the Oris Aquis. And I find this to be an interesting play on the subject because we look over the last three years or so, colors and watches have been injected more and more. The more vibrant, the more head scratching, the better in some circumstances. There has been a huge surge in the popularity of green watches and basically every brand has been doing it. Now we could say for this one example that Omega is on the back foot. They are bringing out a green watch a little late, kind of like a whole year too late. But you notice how there was this huge initial swell in the choice of green pieces about a year or two ago and that interest has slowly tapered off. So many brands have been doing it. And it's gotten to a stage now where we're looking at other variations of colors like turquoise blue, for example. I made a whole video discussing the green with envy phase and how this interest climbed and climbed and climbed. We could say on one end that Omega with their most, we could say influential and important dive watch that they currently own in the modern space, are trying to get onto this bandwagon. But as the interest in green has simmered down a little bit after the initial hype, they can see a color like this on a watch without the noise, without the external influence of so many other brands and the sheer chaos of everyone chasing after the same result. Here I see a watch that has, we could say, arrived late to the party, but now has the place to itself. It has some breathing room, and it's clear that Omega is very confident in the product because they didn't dress it up, they didn't try and present it too heavily. Instead, they kept it simple, going to the extent of even removing the red elements on the dial that has defined the Seamaster line in this zone and allowed for the color to speak for itself. Funny enough, this tone of green has been used on Seamasters before. I believe they fell into the 120M category, a very underrated series of models that have a skin diver feel to them. So the Seaweed Seamaster, a brilliant color chosen for this watch. I think a lot of us can agree. I've read some very interesting comments of people saying that they have never paid attention to the Seamaster Professional line until now. A color like this is bringing a lot of people around to look at the watch again, myself included. Seeing a color combination like this on a model that has a matching rubber strap is very appetizing. Comparing a watch like this to the Hulk or the Sermit Submariner, completely different tones of green. This color screams sophistication, it screams elegance. In some lights, the green is so dark it could be mistaken as black. As far as versatility goes, when we look to the color, it also checks the box brilliantly, offering great opportunities for strap changes, but also being muted enough that it won't clash with the colors that you wear. As someone who would always opt for a blue watch over a green watch, this color speaks to me. So the color of this watch has no comparison next to the Sermit Submariner or even the Oris Aquas. A better watch to compare it to is the Glasuta Original CQ. These two tones are very similar, almost identical. And if we're getting further into the theory of color and why it was so effective for a dive watch, 
We look to kelp forests, we look to seaweed, and we see how well that fits into the environment. From a legibility point of view, it's also allowing the white elements to stand out extremely well. And by no means is the color overpowering. I'll repeat again that the interest in this watch has increased so much just because the color has been addressed properly. But you know me, I have my reservations about the modern Seamaster Professional line. I would love to see it adjusted in a few areas. At this stage, the watch has been around for about five years, and apart from a color shift, nothing else has changed. A lot of people have complaints about the overall thickness of the watch, about the helium escape crown, about the lack of tapering to the watch's bracelet. In this very quick mock-up, it took me about three minutes to throw together, I did a couple of minor adjustments to the watch. Removing the helium crown, tapering the bracelet, widening the winding crown, setting a triangle at the 12 o'clock position on the dial, and also allowing for a better relationship between the skeletonized hands by using the pointed tip of the gladius sword on the hour hand as well. If given the opportunity to modify this watch, this would be the kind of procedure I would put it through. Bearing in mind that the chief area of inspiration would be looking at the 165024 or the MOD Seamaster. It is a fantastic looking watch with a fresh lick of paint and is definitely going to pull more people into the Seamaster arena. And I cannot underscore enough how excellently the color has been done on this piece. But the next watch in this arena that I have never paid attention to that has been around for a very long time it has always fallen to the wayside because so much of our focus has been on the important Speedmasters in this zone. The Speedmaster 57, or more commonly known as the George Clooney, is a watch that definitely hasn't seen the same love as models like the professional variants. It is not the iconic Speedmaster, therefore it doesn't get the attention. It probably doesn't even land in the top 10 of most important Speedmasters ever made. In fact, coaxial Speedmasters in general They've been around since about 2013. They've never been given the praise. So what was it about this watch and its release that made me stop and look at it for much longer than I ever thought I would? The spec sheet. The specifications around this watch are amazing. First thing we need to talk about is the CK2915. The original Broad Arrow Speedmaster is getting so much focus. In fact, one of the first videos I made this year was on the Canopus Gold 321 variant. We've seen this increase in interest over the course of Philips auctions and many other shows. But even still, the Broad Arrow design is one that doesn't speak to everyone. Understandably so. On one hand, I look at the watch and I don't really understand what it is because it's a vintage inspired model that's paying tribute to the first Speedmaster that began it all but at the same time is incorporating many modern elements that pushes it in another direction while still looking vintage. In a nutshell, it's like the watch is going in two different circles. But if we move away from looking at this watch and all the infinite timelines that it belongs to, and we just focus on the aesthetics, a bicompax arrangement, a date complication at the six, a Speedmaster that's 40 millimeters in diameter, that has a very reasonable lug length of about 49, a bicompax arrangement, which is very symmetrical with much larger scales than usual. The watch still having a 12 hour totalizer, but such an intuitive way of being able to read the chronograph by just judging the hands like you would on a clock. Then on top of that, you have so many layers when we look to the stepping, when we look to the sandwiching of the dial, when we look to the overall thickness of the watch, which is just over 12 millimeters. The fact that they have put a beautiful master chronometer certified movement that you would swear was made in Saxony in this watch. It fits the case perfectly. The full frame of the sapphire window allows for you to appreciate the entire movement. And let's not forget the huge innovation that has gone into the bracelet. As a proud owner of a 1957 reissue, I would love to ask if a bracelet like this is available for purchase. Tapering from 20 millimeters down to about 15 with a much better finished clasp, as well as a full push to adjust system. This has got to be one of the most complete flat link bracelets that the brand has ever introduced. Instead of just looking at the colors, which will probably take even more time to discuss, what are you getting as a result with a piece like this? A great play with depth and level of detail when you look to the dial, the batons, the handset. It's extremely simple, it's not cluttered, and also very intuitive by how you read the watch, not only telling the time, but reading the chronograph. You get the enjoyment of a manual wind vintage inspired watch, with a bulletproof movement and a Speedmaster aesthetic. At the same time, one that makes for a great daily companion because you're also getting a date. And on top of it all, using this watch to travel, you have a quick set hour hand, you have a micro adjusting bracelet. And as far as fit and finish goes, it's extremely thin in profile. It's not remotely bulky on the wrist. It is a fantastic package. And bearing in mind that I'm someone who is a fan of this aesthetic and this design, 
you can see that this is a speed master that offers you a lot more in some areas. The gripes that some people might have is that the movement isn't very exciting and I can understand that. But as far as a broad arrow speed master goes, this is one of the best I have seen in a long time. Especially when you look to the colors like the burgundy and the green, applied batons and overall a great result. So after looking at these two models, we can see that they are in different departments. You can't actually believe they belong to the same brand. Where one is just a color change of a more modern proposition, the other looks at a vintage avenue, doing what the brand has done in a couple of arenas looking at the Seamaster 300, where they've tried to keep them old school but integrate them with a modern touch. And instead of seeing this typical tri compax arrangement, a chronograph in the Speedmaster category that adopts your CK styled case, you're getting a watch here that offers you that symmetry, the practicality of a date complication, while also being streamlined and intuitive. All I can say after looking at these two watches and the Seamaster Ultra Deep is that I'm very excited to getting these watches in hand. Every single one of these in their own separate way is inviting enough by itself. I want to see that color green on the Seamaster. I want to feel how well the Ultra Deep fits on my wrist and enjoy the balance of a master coaxial Speedmaster. And that is what I think makes Omega such a compelling brand to look at. Yes, they offer tons of variations that can be a detractor for us as enthusiasts, but they're also not afraid to test the boundaries, to look back into their playbook, to experiment with new ideas and concepts, ultimately offering us a wide range of watches that we can get to enjoy. And in this climate today where the sports watch is getting harder to find, increasing in demand and popularity, these are the sorts of watches from a reputable brand that we should be paying attention to.